Welcome back. Our final panel is on cultural heritage protection in the maritime environment. As a reminder, all conference materials are available for download at the bottom of the events page. There's an agenda and the full bios of everyone who has participated. We will go straight into our final panel for today. It is my great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Chris Jaspero as moderator for this panel. He's a formal Naval officer, a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, and currently a professor in the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval War College. He serves as the Jerome Levy Chair of Economic Geography. He is a ge geographer and archeologist with over 25 years of experience specializing in environmental security, cultural heritage protection, and African and Asian regional geography and transnational security issues. As my co-organizer, this panel in particular was his priority for the entire event, and I'm really looking forward to the selection of speakers he has for it. Dr. Jaspero, I invite you to commence your panel. Good morning and thank you, Andrea. Uh, so for our last panel, uh, we'll look at issues of exploitation and protection of cultural heritage in the maritime domain. As you heard from our keynote speaker, there are a variety of areas where maritime cultural heritage issues intersect with human security issues at sea, as well as uh, broader strategic issues. Um, and like with human security in general, attention to it at sea has lagged behind that of, on land, but um, progress is being made. And as you'll see, we have speakers from three allied navies who will uh, look at different angles of the problem and hopefully give us a sense of uh, where things are going. Our first speaker is Commander Andy Cheel of the Royal Navy. Um, he's a naval commando specializing in human train analysis and training and mentoring of local forces. Uh, he also holds master's degrees from the London School of Economics in King's College London. Um, currently, he's leading the Royal Navy's contributions to the UK's Defense Human Security Project. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Andy. Thanks very much, Chris. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you let me know when you can see and hear me okay? Okay, well, good uh, morning and good afternoon to everybody um, uh, who's attending. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure listening in, and um, uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, these sort of events are really critical to um, to sort of cooperation, but also to to our national development um, in, in this, this area. Um, for this panel, I'm really pleased to be going first, um, as I can be a, a bit of a scene setter, try and uh, situate where cultural property sits within human security for the Royal Navy. Um, and also, I'm most definitely the least venerable of the, of the panel speakers, so uh, you, you'll forgive me my academically lightweight points, but I'll I'll stick to the uh, representation of a process of applying human security themes within uh, an operational level uh, battle staff within a Navy. Um, so very briefly to describe the UK journey, um, as a few other contributors have already mentioned, um, we've been um, we've been through this process of taking a fairly nebulous academic concept of complementary freedoms and dependencies, um, how that links to instabilities, and then and then had to. Um, process those through both UN and NATO interpretations um, with their own lenses to the start of the UK human security agenda, um, including cultural property, which for, for the UK um, commenced in really with the, um, the 2000 uh, Security Council resolution on women, peace and security, because the UK holds the pen for that. Um, and it remains a priority uh, agenda item for our foreign Commonwealth and uh, Development Office. Um, but there's more to be understood about vulnerabilities of cultures, as, as uh, everybody here knows, you know, the, the, the values um, and underrepresentation of uh, the values of cultures and the underrepresentation of women and children um, is symptomatic of, of other fragilities. And, um, and we're coming along on the, this ride of sort of exploring further where um, um, uh, the, the fault lines lie within communities and where that in, uh, in, influences military operations where military operations influence that. 
where we're at now uh, in the UK, um, having taken this sort of um, ponderous walk since 2000, I, I would apologise for this slide, but but kind of the complexity is the point um we've i've stolen by the way this grid here from uh, an army colleague um but we've we've taken the challenges of um interpreting a, a range of concepts and uh, and trying to set on something that works for us so it has to meet our un nato and partnership obligations um, and we're some way down that process now with um this year sees the second policy edition for human security uh describing a broad umbrella term which has allowed us to identify how we interpret those seven factors plus one because we've added in um, information security and how we've aligned those with the nato cross-cutting themes um, but is also sovereign to us and works with our uh, our um, sovereign operations um well so what well in terms of policy that's great so we've got we've got fairly mature policy now um, but we do still need to there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand how we apply that it's yet to be um human security and cultural property protection cultural vulnerabilities are yet to be standard vernacular at the, the operational level um, whilst tactically there's an imperative to get on with it which is which is great and quite right too but what that means is that we're sort of retrospectively building our understanding and our um you yeah, know there's all, all important real case studies and vignettes that help us explain tactical application of human security we're, we're building those through um, existing operations and, and those um, the most simplest way of doing that for us has been predominantly through the sort of mission imperative of Afghanistan more recently recent year, years Afghanistan and then um, operations that we have in Mali for example um, and less so some of the maritime examples because they um, they are sort of um, in perpetuity running so um so the navy doesn't yet have quite such a clear understanding but it but it's growing and um the argument w i would make is is that we would probably put um, issues such as children in armed conflict protection of civilians sex and gender based violence um whilst uh, absolutely critical to the international community don't mean so much to a cohort of submariners for example delivering our strategic deterrence um but those self-same submariners or crews of um, the new carrier strike groups that we, we send out on an annual basis are still contributing to human security via that sort of maritime security that we've already been talking about. Um, and they have therefore opportunities to enhance um, the, the overall stability. And that's that may be more likely to be through cases of human trafficking, as we've just discussed, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse and enhancing uh, the understanding of what that actually means. Um, or, and what brings us here today, uh, or to this panel, I should say, is um, how issues of cultural property protection um, matter in the maritime. So trying to situate then um, human security in the maritime domain um, and with a maritime force, um, we have a fairly well-established paradigm which we are now pushing to broaden um, and that involves answering a number of questions. What risks and opportunities lie for the maritime um, in the cultural narrative and concepts of individual vulnerabilities and community vulnerabilities? What types of operations matter most and, and how do they matter? Um, and whilst I take um, uh, a couple of speakers' points from yesterday about the distinction between kinetic operations and then the everything else, the sort of pre and post kinetic, where human security perhaps is more relevant, disaster relief um, uh, operations being a really, um, really sort of central target in that sense. But there are more ways that we could understand human security and cultural property. And uh, underwater heritage and cultural property is a really good demonstration of that, in fact. Um, so the UK going through sort of um, a defence transformation programme, some of the modern warfare themes, such as the total deterrence concept, modern deterrence concepts, and return to strategic commando raiding, all bring issues of cultural respect, understanding and protection, as well as concepts of UK uh, cultural vulnerabilities to the fore. Um, and the Hague Convention obliges us to know about cultural property, and as um, one of my uh, one of my colleagues who knows a lot more about cultural property than me um, often puts it decisions of, of what to break and what not to break um, and, and how we could avoid breaking things. But but also, where does cultural property sit in the battle for sub threshold advantage um, and uh, what does it imply for items of you know, sort of cultural totems and, and uh, items of high value? 
So on the left of ARC, we could say that we start with traditional protection of UK cultural property within territorial waters where the task is clear uh, relatively, um, but it's left to a random mix of UK enforcement agencies. Um, and then uh, more problematically in international waters, uh, where the different laws or lack of um, and patchy application of the UNCLOS um, all make the issue more problematic. Um, our resources and advocates are spread thin. So cultural property of the UK state, such as warships, um, may translate to vulnerabilities, perhaps. And then towards the right of ARC, and perhaps more innovatively, acknowledging the, the um, outstanding work by the Royal Canadian Navy in this area, is understanding the role of, the, of cultural property as totemic points um, in issues of strategic narrative and establishing where that sits in the information campaigns of our adversaries, uh, where is it being exploited within sub-threshold disruption. Um, pillaging of pre-atomic steel, for example, in, in the uh, South China Seas um, means that we're losing cultural artefacts ostensibly due to economic pressures. Um, but actually, this, this loss suits the wider narrative of a, of an, of a regional hegemon. Um, the UK, Australian, Dutch, and, and I think perhaps US Java Sea Rex are, are now almost all gone um, and closer to home and in keen focus for a Navy, which is about to take over the maritime NATO response force duty in, in, in January. Um, we're well aware that in the Baltic, there are German wrecks being uh, looked at, in inverted commas, by various diving groups with nationalist associations. Um, so the journey there with human security and, and cultural property is a, is a really fundamental um, uh, issue of cultural sensitivity has brought us to the point of trying now to operationalize uh, human security with some tactical level doctrine. Um, and um, it's time really for us to get writing, which is where, like, as I said at the start, these collaborations and partnerships are so valuable. So thank you for everybody's thoughts. Um, human security needs to find its way more into the Royal Navy DNA. It is getting there um, and a better understanding of what we can do to avert further sorry stories like that of HMS Repulse shown here on the left and then shown on the right or not shown as it's steadily being taken from us by uh, salvages and looters um, from its final resting place and the resting place of hundreds of, of British sailors. Um, that's, that's what I have to really start the conversation. Uh, I'd be delighted to join into the panel. Thank you. And with us, we have Commander Panos Tripantikas from the Hellenic Navy, who, in addition to being a surface officer with uh, command at sea experience, is also a author and uh, cultural heritage researcher and specialist. He's presently serving as a staff officer in the Department of Information and Environmental Protection uh, for the Hellenic Republic's Ministry of Defense. So, uh, Panos? Yes, Chris, thank you very much uh, uh, for presenting me. Uh, I want to thank uh, U.S. Naval uh, World College and uh, Andrea for the invitation. It's a uh, it's a privilege and uh, fills me with uh, honor. Uh, I've heard, um, you know, I have a disclaimer also that this uh, presentation uh, presents my perspective for the underwater heritage of Hellenic Navy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, having heard all these uh, presentations uh, the day uh, yesterday and uh, today reminds me uh, it reminds me just a moment. Uh, how is it? How I can. Okay, it reminds me uh, what Walt Disney said our heritage and ideas are called the uh, standards, the things we live by and teach our children are, uh, are preserved or diminished by how freely we exchange ideas and feelings. And uh, this is what we are doing uh, now. Uh, to give you another perspective of protection of. Uh, cultural heritage uh, is uh, what uh, Giorgio Seferis uh, said, one of the most important Greek poets of the 20th century. Erasing a piece uh, from the past is like erasing uh, a piece uh, from the future. Uh, I have an holistic uh, approach, uh, shaping our mindset on both cultural heritage uh, and nature. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's... Uh, the basic perception that cultural heritage and nature viewed, viewed as indivisible and not revolutionary. Let's have a, a quick peek uh, here in the slide. You can see Greece, uh, both uh, uh, 
uh, nature and uh, culture uh, environment. Uh, we have 44 six uh, areas in Greece that uh, belongs to Natura 2000 network together with the important marine mammal areas. And we have also the underwater heritage uh, of Hellenic uh, Navy. The milestone starts in 1953 where the legislative degree uh, that was issued uh, defines that the ownership of all shipwrecks of warships and any other wreck is given to the shareholding uh, navy's fund uh, um, uh, war materials such as war plates i say i said uh, uh, helmets uh, tanks what, whatever is given to the shareholding navy's uh, funds uh, which is a legal entity subject to public law and under the supervision of the Hellenic Ministry of National Defense via the Hellenic Navy General Staff. And its aim is the development and decrement of the fund's property, pro property movable and immovable. Uh, the second milestone uh, in 2002 is uh, the law about antiquities and the cultural heritage in general, uh, which is the most comprehensive and methodical law legislation on archaeological matters. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, one ministerial decision that changed uh, everything in 2003. And uh, uh, following the Minister of Culture decision, the Rex we mentioned uh, before, the date of seeking of which undertakes the decision by 50 years were designated as cultural assets. So all the other uh, uh, water heritage of Hellenic Navy is a cultural asset to see what, what is a cultural asset. It's uh, the touchable evidence of the existence of man and uh, of his individual and collective activities comes uh, under the definition of cultural assets. However, uh, those wrecks reveal to us acts of courage and uh, facts that uh, significantly change the course of, uh, of history. So I will uh, start uh, saying that uh, uh, all the actions taken by the Hellenic Navy uh, comes from uh, the new environment, not the new, the revised environmental energy and climate change adaptation policy of Hellenic Ministry of National Defense, where you can download it uh, uh, through the site greenarmedforces.mil.gr. Uh, over there, the fields of interest um, is uh, all this that depicted in the slide, but I will stay only in cultural heritage. Uh, where we have to secure the integrity of locations with historical and cultural heritage from military activities, evaluate the possible impact on monuments during the planning and execution stage of works and activities serving the aims of national defense, promote after proper recording, restoration and maintenance, the means, buildings and areas of historical and cultural importance under the ownership of the armed uh, forces. Uh, we have to inform all the uh, we have to inform about all the areas of historical and cultural importance in order to ensure that military operations can be carried out with the least possible damage to the historical and natural environment. So the top priority for Hellenic Ministry of National Defense is to map the areas of historical and cultural importance in all printed and electronic products of the Hellenic Hydrographic Service and the Hellenic Military Geographical Service, uh, thus providing detailed information about protected areas of national, European, and global importance to all potential uh, users. Uh, we are the practitioners, and we need to know, uh, we need to use a tool uh, to see where we are going. So the nautical chart, charts are the unique tools that connect people with our natural and cultural heritage. Uh, these are the means that uh, they can influence not only the, the operational officers that um, they're working uh, on operations, but also the public. Uh, these are the means that, of implementing the relevant ministerial decisions, facilitating the work of the Hellenic Coast Guard, preventing the execution of illegal activities, such as illegal retrieval of objects from domestic or international antiquities gangs, and uh, let's see the wrecks now from a different, uh, we have to see the wrecks from a different perspective. Because as I said before, those wrecks reveal to us acts of courage and facts that significantly change the course of, of history. This heritage is of great importance for forming our identity, our historical continuity, and the self-determination within the historical uh, becoming. 
this legacy evokes great emotions and linked to national, regional, and local tradition or intouchable heritage, which is passed down from generation to generation, providing a sense of identity and continuity, and thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and uh, human creativity. This heritage constitutes the bridge that connects the elements of cultural heritage between the past and the present. And, and of course, it, it is an uh, undeniable value that strengthens the cultural identity of our so society. We know, of course, that the climate is changing and uh, um, this is a challenge and the challenge is that uh, the impacts are not always, are, are not always visible uh, to us. Every challenge, of course, is an opportunity. Uh, talking about challenges, uh, uh, talking about the possible impact of climate change on other water heritage, and we are talking about the, the second World War I and II naval vessels. Uh, most of these ships are made of rusting metal, still hold arm armaments, uh, vast quantities of oil, etc., and the temperature, the increasing of temperature, salinity, and of course, acidification. Um, change the, the change uh, uh, the um, the way that uh, changes uh, the sea uh, makes it hotter and more acidic and of course uh, shipwrecks are uh, deteriorating and uh, maybe loss of cultural uh, heritage uh, environmental disaster is inevitable. So uh, we have an, an initiative, a Hellenic Minister of National Defense, uh, together with the Cosity and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, we have a two-year project starts, uh, started uh, one month ago. Um, the acronym is Monument, Monuments and Risk, and has to do with uh, the climate change and uh, the effects upon uh, those uh, heritage uh, sites. And another MOU between Hellenic Ministry of National Defense and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki has to do uh, um, in particular with documentation of all these uh, shipwrecks lying down in uh, the Hellenic uh, seas due to an emerging need for Hellenic Navy to study and preserve uh, its uh, submerged cultural uh, resources. Discovering and mapping this part of our naval heritage and history can help us rediscover ourselves, because at the end, culture is not the privilege of only one, but it is open and has to be open to everyone. Uh, being proactive uh, is not enough. Uh, if the box is nearby, then it, it is still an obstacle to open uh, thinking. Uh, we've heard the thinking beyond uh, the obvious, it's a way to, to move forward, but uh, I strongly believe that uh, we have to think uh, the obvious, because over there we can find the solution, we have to think uh, simply. Of course, uh, we need to join effort, co-perception, cooperation, communication and public outreach with public sectors, private sectors, universities, diving community, community and of course nations. Uh, two key points is that uh, we have to educate and develop the next generation adaptable leaders in order to understand, to fully, to fully understand, to fully understand, sorry, in, uh, in order to fully understand the, the complexity and what is culture for, uh, for us. We have also to enhance and promote uh, military open uh, science, uh, meaning that we have to involve armed forces in general in scientific endeavor that generates new knowledge and deeper understanding. Uh, of course, a collaboration between scientists and armed forces and navies who are concerned and motivated to make a difference. Anyone can part participate. We have to use the same protocol with the scientists so data can be combined and be high quality. And of course, as uh, uh, yesterday, a lot of um, panelists said, we have to share data uh, to which the public uh, uh, as well as the scientists uh, can have uh, access. That concludes my briefing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's, you managed to fit a, a lot of big themes in a small presentation. So that is a, 
a work of art. Um, and particularly appreciate you hitting some of the bigger themes of the conference in terms of uh, you know, the need for militaries to engage with communities, which is not our necessarily our natural habit, um, as well as bringing the environmental dimension into the discussion. Um, so we have all our panelists on board now. So let's start with some questions and please keep sending, sending them into the chat. Uh, first question is for Andy is what, what is the primary purpose of the UK's human security project? Is it, is it policy and how does it aim to translate into the operational arena? Very good question. The, it's the, the second iteration of the policy that makes that clearer, actually, having operated on one for a couple of years. Somebody thought it'd be worth articulating what it's all for. Um, I, I won't remember what it is verbatim, um, but it's effectively this is about better operational outcomes, um, particularly in this sort of era of multi-domain integration uh, and the, the UK's integrated review that we've just been through. Um, it's not about improving the military operation it's about improving the influence uh, and effect that we have um, using every lever so uh, the, so the overall outcome is a better operation and better effect overseas and better defense of um, of what we have as UK sovereign um, assets but um, the trick is convincing every lever of power that they have to understand each other's motivations because this is human security is of, of everything I have looked at, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be people that agree of every concept of security and uh, uh, and um, sort of conceptual debate we've had. This is probably one of the um, the least defined or um, the the most pan government concepts that we've come across. So it's not just a case of convincing defence, what they need to achieve. It's convincing defence, how they need to support the Foreign Office and the Department for Trade and the Department for Transport and the Department for International Development as well, as, and vice versa. Um, but better operational outcome in one line. Great. Thank you. Um, a re related question um, would be, you know, in terms of if we look at the, the informational aspect of uh, the problem, you know, in terms of what, how navies can prepare to, to work in this environment, what do they need? Um, you know, is it just concepts and doctrine? Is it new, new types of people or, or new capabilities? And, you know, what, what other agencies should should be involved because it's something that clearly involves navies, but it's, it's sort of out of the um, you know realm of things that navies traditionally do. And this is for all the panelists. Can I answer first? Can I try to answer first? Please. I totally agree. First of all, with uh, what uh, Commander Andrew said, or Andrew, uh, let's say, but. Uh, I think uh, it's a very difficult uh, problem for the defense uh, to solve because uh, we are dealing uh, with a situation that uh, we don't know the, the potential yet. We still we are wondering uh, what climate change, uh, uh, what are the climate change impacts, uh, first of all, on, of, of uh, operations. So uh, we need to deeply understand what is culture. Uh, and that is why I said before that uh, uh, we have to change, let's say, the protocol that uh, we are working for uh, the next uh, leadership because uh, the, the practitioners, for example, in Greece, that they are now the commanding officers, they are going to be the, the leaders uh, in 10 years uh, from now on. And uh, those leaders, they have to, to be adaptable. They, they, they need to understand in order to... Uh, in order to take the, the best decision. And we are talking about the decision-making process. I think it's a very difficult situation now. It's evolving. And first of all, I think that we, we need to, to change the way that the leaders are thinking. It needs a general overview of the situation and it needs to have a deeper understanding. I mean, 
we need to understand what biodiversity, for example, means. We need to understand uh, what uh, one degree Celsius uh, means uh, in uh, when we are operating uh, with uh, submarines. That is that uh, going to affect uh, us uh, on transmission loss, for example. Uh, uh, can uh, this um, have an effect, an effect, an uh, impact uh, on uh, my operation? So, okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Andy or Dan, do you have anything? Um, well, I mean, I would add in a, a sort of a quite a procedural problem that we're facing in, in the UK at the moment is that um, I, I sort of hinted at it in the presentation. Um, to, for the for navies to be able to do something about this, the strategic demand signal has to be explicit, um, because we we deploy on operations of maritime security or disaster relief or power projection, defence engagement, whatever the vernacular is in, in your respective country. But within that, um, you know, we don't we don't have that freedom of, of, of movement to just interpret human security objectives as we go um, it's not that people are averse to it but it's just not in the specified tasks and it's and it's not yet implied strongly enough so we we need integration with partners with international partners to to make explicit requests that can be fed in you know over the course of time and that takes a while to get there which i believe it will but it'd be nice if it was a bit faster yeah, thank you if uh, Daniel, uh, yes, okay, finish. yes uh, uh, for that the integration, uh, I will give you a, a very simple example. Uh, a very simple example. I mean, if the F4 rate of underwater antiquities in Greece uh, doesn't inform me about the underwater sites uh, in order to uh, to place them in the nautical charts, then probably Andrew, with his uh, vessel, he's going to anchor above a Romanian. Uh, uh, galer and destroy the monument. It, it's the simple way, you know, to think. So the integration, the integration means that not only us as militaries has to have to understand uh, how the other ministries uh, work, but the other ministries need to know what uh, means we have in order to help them to influence via nautical charts, for example, or geographical uh, uh, charts uh, about the monuments. It's a very simple example. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, so it's you know it's challenging in our own waters, but many countries seem to have at least domestic structures to start doing these things. But it's it's much more complicated when we're talking overseas and in international waters and contested spaces. Uh, two questions that are related, so I'll, I'll put them um, together mainly for Andy and Dan. Um, first, do you have any other examples of uh, exploitation of maritime cultural heritage by uh, actors like Russia and China? And also, why are the Java Sea wrecks um, so valuable and what might some of the strategic or geopolitical uh, implications be of this kind of activity? Um, uh, I, uh, you know, noting the question in the um, in the sidebar there, uh, uh, you know, what, what do we gain? Um, I think if you talk about cultural heritage uh, as an isolated um, as an isolated example, uh, other than sort of the 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 moral um, you know the moral issue, uh, it, it it's hard on its own perhaps to to understand other than there's an opportunity uh, and to get to get on the front foot before there's sort of an information campaign against us, but also heritage is just another part of the wider cultural discussion and of course that is key sort of that's the key battleground and a lot of the whatever you want to call it hybrid activity or sub threshold activities so heritage is just one component the other component is diaspora rights you know and and um other anything that is ostensibly of value to a group is something that can be contested now and so underwater underwater heritage is, is just one of those angles and we don't uh I would suggest that it doesn't make it the, the key battleground, but it's one of them. Uh, and we need to understand what that means before it becomes something that is exploited against us. Uh, Chris? 
May yes, I? Yes, Yes, okay. Uh, I will try also to answer the questions that uh, I, I have seen uh, in, in the chat. Uh, so uh, what we gain? We gain our identity. I mean, I will have to reply with a question. Why do we have to save uh, Acropolis monument? And why not try to save uh, the underwater heritage? Is a part of our uh, culture. And uh, with the project I mentioned before, Monuments and Trees, uh, we combine together both uh, environmental uh, uh, information uh, in uh, the CIPREC and also uh, what is the situation of the CIPREC in order to, to try to, uh, to preserve it. Because uh, one way or another, uh, those monuments uh, are open uh, to the public with some restrictions. So first of all, we need uh, uh, to show to the public, to the diving community, because we are talking about uh, um, economics that uh, we are dealing uh, with, also with our identity. So uh, I believe we gain a lot of things. Uh, also, we gain ourselves because we have a deeper understanding uh, um, of our ancestors, uh, of our uh, you know battles that uh, uh, we have uh, given, and uh, it's the only way to move uh, forward. Great. Uh, thank you all for those answers. Yeah, there's, you know, a need to take a multi-faceted look at these problems. There's the strategic angle, which, you know, is really not about wrecks or not, but about controlling terrain, basically, and um, winning. There's the I identity issues, the economic issues. I mean, cultural tourism is is about the biggest sector of tourism um, and underwater tourism can be particularly high value. So if it's managed correctly, there is a financial as well as uh, identity incentives. There's also uh, in terms of post-conflict rehabilitation of uh, combatants, we have projects where, for example, US special operations veterans are being trained in underwater archaeology, um, both as part of uh, recovery process from combat, but also to, to train a new uh, post-military skill. So it's a very big uh, issue if you look at all the pieces. Uh, another question we have for Panos is the, the reserves that Greece has set up that are both um, environmental and heritage protected areas. Um, that seems to be an interesting model that can be applied more broadly around the world. Has there been any uh, cooperation with Greece and other countries in developing these type of uh, sanctuaries? Uh, it's uh, something that started a few years ago. And uh, of course, uh, we have to, um, <clears throat> to work with other nations uh, for this. And... Uh, that panel uh, is uh, making a good, uh, you know, work to to achieve this because uh, uh, it helps us to to come uh, uh, to know people uh, from other nations and uh, discuss it and uh, to see what other nations uh, are doing and uh, help us uh, to work uh, better in a, and in a more efficient uh, way. It's. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, situation, and uh, you know the most important thing is to to understand uh, what is a culture. Okay, the most important issue. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions or anything that the uh, panelists would like to add that they didn't get a chance to to address previously? Okay, good. Well, we are near the, the end of the session. So uh, thank you all for uh, your, your presentations and answers. Uh, it's obviously a big area that more work is needed on. Uh, just a couple of comments before I turn it back to uh, Andrea. First, you know, thanks to um, of course, again, the Naval War College Foundation that sponsors the, the Levy Chair in this conference and the uh, 
President of Naval War College's Admiral Chatfield's uh, support for this event. Um, of course, thanks for everybody who helped support and participate in the event. And um, lastly, because there's nobody else to say it, but thank you to uh, Andrea, whose effort, not only was this her idea, but her efforts were um, fairly Herculean. You might have guessed as much by the thousand emails you probably all got, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and not only is she organizing this conference, but this is our busiest time of year for teaching in our department, um, all while being a, a virtual detailee to the Pentagon. So uh, thank you, Andrea, and get some sleep this weekend. Thank you, Chris. I'd like to thank all of the final panelists, uh, Chris, Andy, and Panos. What a fantastic panel that really brought our whole event full circle. You focused on UK and kind of went back to that very large human security lens. And I'm through, thoroughly impressed that you have a dedicated human security function. And then we went through the in-depth discussion about cultural heritage and the importance of preserving our history. During this event, we sought to expand the concept of human security into the maritime environment to initiate pro a proactive strategic thought on these issues. We did this by asking all our panels to explore how their specific human security topic affected the maritime strategic environment and what it meant for navies and coast guards. My favorite component is always learning about how navies and coast guards are thinking through their operational policy and force options. This is a very solutions oriented approach and we can all learn e from each other in looking at this. As you can see from the speakers, we carefully assembled a mix of scholars and practitioners as well as admirals and senior officers directly working on these issues in their respective countries. This event started with an idea in my head when I saw militaries operationalizing the human security concept, but overlooking the maritime component. It has been wonderful bringing this idea to Chris and collaborating with the support of the Levy Chair in Economic Geography to make this happen. By being virtual, we were able to bring together experts from around the world and record the event for many more to access it in the future. I truly appreciate everyone's participation and your interest in the subject. Again, I'd like to thank all the speakers and moderators for their participation today, as well as our special events team of Charlotte and Carolyn, Public Affairs Office, Media Services, Alumni Programs, and the members of our Climate and Human Security team, Josh Fagan, Curtis Bell, and Michael Bush, who collaborated and supported this event. While I was on camera, it took a large team to deliver this event today, and I couldn't have done it without them all. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, everyone. This concludes our virtual conference on human security in the maritime environment.